For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 21, your fellow redeemed. The culmination of history is upon them. The greatest events that have been echoed for thousands of years are shortly taking place. Since creation, this is no understatement, since creation, the world has been eagerly anticipating the moment that in a few short hours or really probably a few short days is about to take place. These are events that we are told angels in heaven very descriptively stoop down, look into with great interest because the threshold of prophecy is about to be crossed over to fulfillment. And sadly, those who are best prepared, those who sat in in the greatest vantage point that individuals made in the image of God but fallen in sin, those that had the best advantage were missing it. They were God's people called to be his representatives to a world, to reflect his light to others, and yet they missed it. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, we see time and time again, religious leaders take their shot at Jesus. There are are many instances that Mark himself shares with us, including the scribes. We've got the Pharisees. We've got Sadducees. We've got Herodians in there. And the scribes are often connected with the Pharisees who are seeking to discredit, to undermine, to trap Jesus and just bring him to an end. He's so incredibly inconvenient. The pattern is clear, though. Jesus is moving to the cross. He's moving to the cross to earn the salvation for all people, us and and them who would do him harm. All the events that were foretold throughout the scriptures, some, some 297 promises in the 39 books of the Old Testament are being fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. He has come to save and rescue humanity from sin, death, and the power of the devil. Jesus is moving forward with full, complete knowledge that he's moving forward to die. Jesus is moving forward knowing that he will be shut out from the presence of God the Father Almighty, whom he is one with, whom he has enjoyed, let's just put it this way, all of eternity with. He is going to be shut out from him, forsaken by him, so that you and I don't have to be. I mean, that's amazing love. Jesus becomes our sin. He becomes our sin, and then his righteousness, he imputes or transfers or is given to us. Jesus is reaching out. He's constantly, always reaching out calling people will they live in this time of grace right now we are living in this beautiful time of grace the lord has given us and even those who actively reject him mock him jeer him hate him he is reaching out to them in love that they would be saved now with time drawing to a close and and i think you i think everyone here can relate to this with time is drawing to a close when when something, an event that you care about or a a season of life that you're in, when it's drawing to a close, it feels like it's moving faster. It feels like there's greater intensity. Everything's speeding up, and yet everything else around it is growing shorter and shorter and shorter. The religious leaders, they are the antagonistics here. The leaders of them, we saw the Pharisees just a few weeks ago in this text of Mark here, chapter 11 and 12, take aim at Christ, try to discredit him, they fail. The Herodians came, the Sadducees came, and then at the end of this this exhausting exchange to some extent, this antagonism poured on Jesus, and yet again, God uses it masterfully to show who he is. Comes a scribe, the man we're going to talk about today. This, This scribe comes. Now, Matthew tells us he's coming to test Jesus, which you could say, well, wasn't wasn't that what the other guys were doing? And they were, yet the text also provides insight that they hated him, so they wanted to destroy him. We're not told that about this person. We're we're told that he's coming to test Jesus because he's seen how Jesus has conducted himself under such heavy fire. We're even told that he liked the answers Jesus gave. that's, That's awesome. And then you're going to notice this. When I read the text, 
you're going to notice a huge difference in the exchange that Jesus has with, with the scribe versus the exchanges that he's had with the Pharisees and the Herodians and the Sadducees. You're going to see that. And maybe, by the grace of God, this man walked away understanding and even better believing in Jesus, the Savior. You know, we don't know that. The text doesn't tell us that. The rest of Scripture is silent about this individual. But it leaves a very encouraging moment for us. But even better, the Lord is teaching us something about himself. Let's take a look at that. Mark 12, 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he, the he is Jesus, seeing that he answered them well, asked him, the him is Jesus. Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered. The most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that this, that he is one, and that there is no other besides him. And to love him with all heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all, than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he understood, answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. These are, in fact, the very words of God. We pray to the Heavenly Father that he would rightly lead us to recognize, accept that these are his words given by divine inspiration for our growth for our instruction, for our admonition and righteousness. We also take great comfort. The Lord promises the Holy Spirit is loose and active as we consider his word. So to that end we pray. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and treasure it. Amen. It doesn't matter what it is. People love to put things in categories. It's not that we don't just love to put things in categories. Once something goes into a category, we love to consider what is the best, what is the greatest, what is number one, what what is all-time ultimate, or I think another term is used, is what is pan-ultimate. It could be any subject. It could be music. It could be sports. It could be leaders, military, political leaders of people. It, It could be scientific achievements. It could be desserts. It's an important category. It could be foods. Well, what food tastes the greatest, but what food is actually the healthiest for you? It could be even superheroes, but that one's easy because it's right in the word superheroes. Certainly the greatest of them would have that word in it, but we'll talk about that later. When we consider then what is the greatest, this naturally leads to a question then. What is the most important thing in life? What is the greatest thing in life? What is it that we are to know that we are to have in life that is penultimate? Think of your personal life. If you had to make a hard choice about something, say you came into a season of life where you had to spend less money than you are accustomed to. Maybe you you came into a point in life where you needed to rearrange your time because time needed to be given in a different place than where you normally would. Maybe it's health news. Maybe some health news came and that floored you and so you had to do things differently. Did that thing that you consider most important, was that affected by any of that at all? Would it be? Would what you consider most important be moved, shuffled, rearranged, strained by some other piece of news of that sort? I mean, in light of the sermon text, what is most important in your life? What is it? I think if we're honest, our actions will reveal what is most important to us, whether or not we say it is or isn't. Many would tell you, of course, the most important thing in your life is your health. If you haven't got your health, you haven't got anything. Others won't say their career is most important. They, they won't say, they'll say, I have a career to support my family. The problem is they're never home. When they're home, they're never there. Although they're physically there, they're not mentally or emotionally there because it's, it's, you know at work. 
they're at work with their, their thoughts and energy. Maybe it's a cause. Maybe you're saying, hey, I live outside of me, and there's so many causes in the world. I want to leave a smaller carbon footprint, or, or you're looking at some kind of social justice cause, and you're saying, I need to be involved with this to make people's lives better. That's most important. You know, there's a poll taken years ago, really, really, really wild. It claimed to have polled Christians. And then it claimed that the majority of Christians said that the Bible taught them that the most important thing in life is taking care of your family. I pray today, when you leave, after we consider this text, it will be very clear to you what Jesus says is the most important thing. What is of supreme importance. And then... What Christ calls supreme important in our life, and that it is for us, because Christ obviously says it is, that we live in a way that shows that. We're in dangerous territory here. The way Jesus answers the scribe is it's profound. In a way, it's so simple, but, but impossible to live this way, although we want to strive to by the grace of God. Because Christ takes this whole topic in a laser light like focus and he aims right in on the most fundamental of realities and truth he says this you want to know what's most important love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind with all your strength that will lead you then to love your neighbor as yourself Follow the train. You love God with all that you are that will show itself in loving those in your life and in your neighbors, of course, everybody, every human. That's what Jesus is saying. So what we have to do, though, is we have to talk about who God is and what he wants. And honestly, what does that look like? What does that look like? So Jesus takes the scribe. When the scribe answers him, or ask him the question. He answers the scribe. He takes the scribe's attention to the scriptures. Again, notice how brilliantly Jesus uses the scriptures to answer the questions. He takes him back to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 4 through 5. He calls attention right away to the oneness of God. God is one. He takes him to the oneness of God. In other words, what you're seeing here is the doctrine of the Trinity. Jesus taught the doctrine of the Trinity. God is three distinct individuals, yet one God. This is a clear biblical teaching. To be a Christian, one must believe that. That's what the Bible tells us. And throughout the scriptures, have you noticed that Jesus, when he prays to the Father, he talks about God the Father as if God the Father is a distinct person from himself? He talks that way all the time. Because he is. And did you notice that Jesus accepts worship from people? Jesus accepts praise from people? Jesus answers prayers of people? Jesus forgives sins of people as God would forgive sins because Jesus is God. That's right, he is. And Jesus also speaks, especially in John chapter 16, but Jesus speaks of the sending of his spirit as a separate person from him and from the Father to believers. So we have three distinct individuals, but yet one God. This is the Trinity. Jesus teaches the Trinity. The Bible teaches the Trinity. Now, we were fallen people. We're finite. We're not going to figure this out. But we believe what the Bible says. Praise God for that. Part of living in a fallen world is the reality that people are always making gods out of stuff. They're making idols, an idol is a god. An idol is a false god. Friedrich Nietzsche, the German philosopher in the 1800s, went well away from Christianity, especially later in his life. In his book, The Twilights of Idols, he said this, there are more idols in the world than there are realities. I could agree with that. It was said when the Apostle Paul preached on Mars Hill that the, I think the, the amount of people that lived in Athens was around 10,000. It was said there were 30,000 
idols in the city, different little gods of whatever nature. An idol is a false god. A god is, practically speaking, on the street level, whatever is most important to a person. In other words, whatever an individual would run to for comfort and assurance, whatever a person looks to, and it could be a person, place, thing, or idea, whatever a person would say, this brings value to my life, this brings meaning to my life, I am somebody and I matter because of fill in the blank. When there is something that you would move, figuratively speaking, heaven and earth for, when there is someone or something or an idea that you would cross over other, let's just say, ethical lines or barriers to accomplish that goal, to, to basically serve that God, that, that's, that's your God. That's your, practically speaking, that would be a person's God. And if you lose your God, you lose your idol, you would say, my life's not worth living anymore. I can't do this. I'm not a part of that. I don't have this kind of relationship. My life's over. Uh, why am I bothering? And I'm afraid you have a false God in your life. Think about this a little bit. Pray about it over the week. When, when God speaks in this passage, he is demanding exclusive rights to your life. He's saying basically you have a throne in your heart. And I alone will sit in the throne and I will share that with nothing. I will share that with no one. I will share the throne of your life. I will share the most important position in your life, the highest priority, with no one, no thing, no idea at any time. Other commitments, other priorities, other good things must be arranged underneath me in accord to how I say they flow. Imagine that. We want to be careful. We have to be very, very careful here. Because we don't ever want to come to Jesus and pretend that we know more about God than Jesus knows about God. That doesn't ever work. It, it, really, it just doesn't work. Like, can you imagine saying, listen, Jesus, God is number one in my life, but <laughs> you don't understand. i got to pay the bills. Rent is not paid if I don't do A, B, C. And if God's got a problem with that, what can I do? Money is not raining from heaven. You know? Or... Somebody else saying, listen, I'm in a certain season of my life. I'm only going to be in this, this season of my life or my family's only going to be at this time. So we're going to do these things or enjoy these things. And, and you just have to wait, God. A little too demanding over there. The question we have to ask ourselves, we have to probe deep, very deep. What is threatening God's exclusive place in our life? What's threatening that? Is, is it our own comforts? Does God just make us a little too uncomfortable sometimes when he talks this way? Because when you look at what Jesus says, he says, you should love the Lord your God with all you, all. And again, all means all. So just, just no mistake. All means all. All your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your, he's saying everything. So are my comforts getting in the way of that? Am I saying, I want to advance in my career and for me to love God this way, just the two aren't going to collide. So, you know, what do I go with? Or... Do I think about my reputation or, or do I even put my family above him? What battles God for your chief allegiance? It's difficult, but it's a reality. As wonderful and as amazing as a blessing as family can be, that too can become an idol. If it takes the place of God in a person's heart, if God is displaced by something, that something is an idol. Do you notice this passage? This is what's so amazing, though. I want to point this out because I think this is incredible. When Jesus is, is saying, what's number one? God is number one with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul. He's quoting from Deuteronomy 6.4. We read part of that. That's the passage where God at Mount Sinai commands Moses to command the people, primarily, let's say, the fathers or the head of homes, to teach their families about God. To teach them about the Lord that God is as they walk, as they live, as they go about. You know, very all-encompassing thing. To teach them the importance of God. So he's not saying family's not unimportant. After God, it's right there. But after is the point that the Lord is making. In fact, let's be honest. By the grace of God... 
if the Lord blesses you and your children with, with well, you know, we'll call it a long life, the majority of your life with your children is going to be as adults. You're an adult. They're an adult. And so the time that parents have to raise them is so, it's so small. It's incredibly small. And when you're in the midst of it, when you're in the middle of it, it it's, maybe doesn't seem that way, but it's incredibly, incredibly short. So there is actually a very powerful encouragement from the Lord here, which is work hard at it. Work hard at it. Pray to God. Pray to God that you give this faithful witness to them that will strengthen them in their Savior. And so Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. That is, give God your full attention. Attentiveness, right? Attentiveness is a mark of loving God. That is, we set our affections towards him. God is loved by us when we seek him. When we're attentive to him. What he says in his will. Think about it on on this level. What relationship do you know of that you have or you know of somebody having that is absolutely thriving with one or both parties being completely not attentive to each other, paying no attention to each other. I don't know a marriage that is thriving where one spouse pays no attention to the other. I, maybe I'm wrong. I'm just going to go with it. I don't think so. It doesn't work. So Jesus says, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. In other words, your, your whole passion, or your whole person, your passion, your energy, your might, your intelligence. God comes first. Seek him this way. Think of the blessings I mentioned. Think of these. These are wonderful blessings. Family, friends, health, career, recreation times, the skills, the abilities that you have. These are evidences and testimonies of the goodness of God that he has given you in your life. And God wants you to explore them and be of of great benefit and blessing to them, but be a steward of them in the right order. For as soon as they get put in front of God, then you have a problem, and the house all comes tumbling down. So Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Every sermon we preach here by the grace of God is going to always point you back to Jesus. It's going to point you to God. Every day that we live, every step that we take, we take closer to the Lord our God. Isn't this the first commandment? You shall have no other gods. What does that mean? We fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Now here's the thing. When one is following by the grace of God and striving to live in this first commandment of God, that will show itself in how we treat our fellow man. Isn't that amazing? In fact, did you ever realize how important other people are? Now, nobody's going to say other people aren't important, at least no decent person. But look at the high place Jesus gives people. Look at that. Look at where he places them. When he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is calling us to seek the good of our neighbor. And that's what John said in 1 John here. He said, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves... Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In other words, we're called by God then to reflect his love and goodness to other people. That's why Jesus quotes from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Jesus is taking a passage. And he's quoting from it. This passage teaches people, this is your God. As worshipers and followers of the true God, live like him. Show his characteristics to the world, and that means loving his creation. By the way, isn't that what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So let's get this straight. These two commands are not the same. They're not just one. They're they're two distinct commands, but they flow together. Love for God above all things will show itself in love for other people. Your love for God is fundamentally expressed in the way that you love other people, especially those around you. What we cannot do is we cannot say, we cannot confess a love for God, a love for our Savior, a love for his word. Let's just throw in, even have a great, robust knowledge of God and of his word, and then proceed to ignore all people. And show no love to God's people. You can't do that. 
God doesn't do that. We weren't created to do that. Even if you're living a quote-unquote decent life, but not showing love, especially to those in your life, that's not what God is calling us to do. He's calling us to show love to those in our lives. So how does our, look, how does our life look in view of that? In view of loving our neighbor as ourself? And if we truly love, let's say, those around us, how God would have us love them, that would then mean of highest priority, we would share God with them. How can I say I love somebody, I deeply, I care about this person, I love this person, and not share with them that the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ? How can I even pretend to myself that I care about this person if I do not point them to Christ who takes away sins, who forgives sins? How can I say that? I can't. That's the point Jesus is making. You, you can't do that. The, the nature of idolatry, then, is to deify something. It's to take these two commands that God gives and it's to just mess with them a little bit. It's to d- divide your loyalty to, to other things. It's to give your heart to someone or something else over and above God. And you know what's interesting? The man, the scribe, he's getting it, isn't he? Isn't this remarkable? Showing love, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, loving your neighbor as yourself is greater than the sacrifices that were offered at the temple. And by the way, where were they? They were in the temple courtyard. And Jesus is looking around and saying, showing love to these people is God would have you is greater than, you know, whoever gave the greatest sacrifice. I mean, this is remarkable. Now, again, when we think about this, we can't do this. We can't live this way perfectly. And God knows that. God knows that. That's why Jesus did that for us. That's why he pours into you his spirit that you can walk in him in love this way. This scribe is drawn to Jesus by his words. Remember that? The opening of the text like an hour ago when I read it. The man was saying, or the text tells us that the way Jesus was answering, he was drawn to Jesus. And, and Jesus, when he spoke to the other religious leaders, there's deafening silence in their reaction to what he said. But now with this man, this man's like, yeah, that's right. You're right in what you say. And Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And so you have words of challenge from Jesus, but you have words of invitation. Invitation. So it's our prayer that Christ challenges us through his words, but even greater, he invites us to him the God who has loved the Father perfectly for us and given us his righteousness. In his name we pray, amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds centered in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Amen.